together for worship today. And we're especially glad to have some guests with us. If you're visiting with us, we're delighted that you're here. And you're our guest today. We want to get to know you a little bit better. Uh, please do what we all do, and that's sign the registration pad. There are green pads on each of the pews. Uh, members, if you'll go ahead and, and sign in, let us know you're here. And guests, if you don't mind, uh, not only putting your name there, but also so we can get back in touch with you, maybe answer questions or give you some more information. Give us a way to get back in touch with you, maybe your phone number or email address. And we'll be glad to do that uh, in the early part of the week. Well, uh, we've got some things going on this week uh, uh, in the life of our church. Our leadership development team will be meeting on Thursday of this week, and that's an important group. They uh, are looking for ways to match people's gifts and skills with uh, service and uh, positions here in the church on committees and ministries and other things, so please be praying for them. Our church conference where we turn in the names of uh, people serving on various committees is coming up in November, and so uh, we, uh, we need uh, your prayers for that. Also, our Don't Mention Age Group, DMA, uh, they met last week, but they are going on a field trip, having a fun trip to go to the Kent House on the 22nd of this month, um, that's a Friday, and it's going to be a mourning tour, meaning like how people mourn death. Uh, sounds like fun, huh? Is that right, Brent? <laughs> Something like that. Anyway, uh, it'll be a good first trip since the COVID thing, and uh, they'll go out to eat afterwards, and so it should be very interesting and good trip, and we appreciate the leadership of those that do that. And um, so also our Grand Baptist men, I think we'll meet tomorrow night at 6 o'clock, and we also do meet twice a month at that. So it's good to be gathered together, and we're going to sing the family of God and greet one another in the name of the Lord. Judy? I invite you to stand, and let's greet each other this morning as we celebrate being a part of the family.
Father and our God, once again, we are awakened to the wonders of your creation on this beautiful day. We thank you for the change of seasons that we see all around us, the brightness of the sky, the beauty of the world, and our place in it. And especially today, we thank you for the rest and repose that we can have when we draw aside, when we come to this Sabbath place, meeting with our fellow followers of Christ, finding refreshment in our place of worship. Thank you for those who join us today in person and for those at home who join us by way of the internet. We pray for those who need your healing touch today. Raise them up to wholeness. Bring health and recovery to their bodies and their minds. Help them to rejoin us here in person and serve you by serving others. Father, be with our community leaders, our state and national leaders, those who make important decisions each day that impact our lives. Be with our first responders and the medical staffs who work tirelessly during this pandemic. So, Father, help us as a church to listen to the needs of our community, to move to help those in need and have your vision of compassion and outreach to the least and to the lost here in Pineville and beyond. So Father, we pray all this in the name of Jesus, our Savior, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. steps of the altar.
question and answer game real quick, okay? If you, if it's true, you raise your hand and you've heard this before, okay? All right, so raise your hand if you've ever been to a football game, okay? Or a sports game, baseball, anything. You ever been to a game like that before? Okay. Or well, raise your hand if you watch one on TV. Yeah. All right. Now, raise your hand if you've ever cheered really, really loudly for your favorite team. Yeah, I kind of did that a whole lot, probably. Okay. Well, have you ever seen cheerleaders come out and do one of these? Yes? Do you know why they do one of these? Because they want to get on. Because they get really loud, right? a megaphone. It helps your voice be really, really loud even if you don't have a microphone on. Because not everybody has really, really loud voices. And sometimes you want to really yell on for your team, right? Well, did you know the Bible talks a lot about shouting and yelling? It does. And one in particular, and this one was one of my favorite ones, Psalm 98 verse 4 says, Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Break forth in a joyous song and sing His praises. We spend a lot of time here in Louisiana, or at least I have, because I've been here. Yeah, we do. And we hear a lot of people yell, they're tigers, right? Yep. Yeah, you hear that at school sometimes. You hear that a lot, right? But we don't hear too many people running around and saying, praise God, or thank you, God, do we? Or God is good. What would it be like? Wouldn't it be pretty cool if every morning we wake up and we stretch and instead of being all grumpy like we are sometimes in the morning, we grab the megaphone and shout it. This is the day the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. That would be pretty cool, wouldn't it? It'd probably make our day go a little bit better, right? Maybe, you think so? Or if every time something good happened, we shout it. Thank you, God. We don't do that a whole lot, do we? We forget to. So I want to give you our challenge this week. Are you ready for your challenge? All right, your challenge this week is to try to every day tell God thank you for something, okay? And you can shout it to him. That's okay. You can shout it to him. Let your mom and dad hear you shout thank you, God. That'd be pretty awesome, wouldn't it? Well, I want us to remember that God is happy any time he hears us, okay? But before we pray and in our children's moment this morning, I'm going to ask Pastor Steve, he has no idea this is happening. Pastor Steve, could you please stand up? I'm going to stand up here so you guys can see it right where you are. But. Well, Pastor Steve, today happens to be Pastor Appreciation Day. And so our Sunday school kids this morning made you a plaque. You guys all did this with your fingerprints this morning, didn't you? Your thumbprints. This is a thumbprints from everybody's Sunday school this morning with the kids, and it says, thank you for helping us grow. Well, thank you. That is so much. Look at that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. about our gifts to God and the fact that God has given us so much, we return a portion of that which he has given us back to his kingdom's work. Part of that kingdom's work is here with these children, with our youth. Uh, last Sunday, uh, we had an opportunity to, to feed them and, and be with them. That was great. They had a good group, very active and engaged in learning about king, the kingdom of God. But on the other spectrum, we have our don't mention age group, the DMA group that met. And so we try to uh, minister to the wide spectrum of age groups here, from Sunday school classes and uh, missions groups and other things. And I hope you know that whenever you, you give, that that's going to support those ministries for all ages. 
right here at the church. So as our ushers will now come forward, we'll receive our offering. Father, we thank you for these children that have come forward today to be a part of this lesson and that are now engaged in the children's church learning about the grace and mercy of their loving Savior. So, Father, we pray that you'll bless uh, our ministries that reach out to people of all ages here at the church, that you'll bring the light of Christ wherever we go. In Christ's name we pray.
this week on Monday, you're probably aware that Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp, all owned by the same company, uh, went dark for six hours. For six hours, those servers were down. Uh, they reported it was because they were trying to upgrade or update uh, a, uh, a router. And something went wrong, whatever. But it was terrible. You know, people couldn't communicate for six hours. I had to go find an old Polaroid camera and take a picture of my lunch and go <laughs> knock on my neighbor's doors and show them what I had to eat that day. Just terrible. Well, we also found out that owner and founder of Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, he lost $7 billion in revenue that day from advertising. $7 billion. Now, for most people, that would be absolutely devastating. But you gotta understand, Mark Zuckerberg isn't like other people. So he uh, he's on that list. Every year, Bloomberg does the billionaires index. And the top five people, Mark Zuckerberg is usually in there at number four, but he slid all the way down to number five. Now, the, the top people on that list are, first of all, Elon Musk. He's the top with $210 billion. And then right under him is Jeff Bezos. You get how much he, he makes. There's a French guy who's third, Bernard Arnault. Then after him is uh, Bill Gates. And then all the way down now at number five is Mark Zuckerberg with $167 billion. So Mark's going to be okay. All right? He's still going to be able to order extra cheese on that cheeseburger, okay? Unless he's eating kosher. And he's still going to be able to supersize things and still going to be able to afford plenty of hoodies. Those guys, we can't imagine having those, that kind of money, having those kind of resources, having that kind of financial security in our lives. What would we do with it all? Well, some of them kind of don't know what to do with it, so they build rocket ships for themselves, stuff that only countries usually can do, and very few of those can afford to do, and go into space. It's hard to imagine that kind of wealth. But great wealth has existed for many years, and it existed during the time of Jesus. In fact, the story we will read today is an account of a rich young man, a rich young ruler, who not only had money, but he also had apparently authority, two things that the world strives for very much. And this account is so important, it's in three of our Gospels. It's in Matthew 18, it's in Luke 16, and here it's in Mark, the 10th chapter. Now Mark, the 10th chapter, these, by the way, these accounts are very similar to themselves, including all the dialogue that Jesus has with this young man. But Mark adds a particular feature of it, a particular phrase that is unique to Mark that I think helps us understand what this is all about. So we'll be reading from Mark, the 10th chapter. If you're able to stand, please do. It's a rather long reading. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. Now, you know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, teacher, I have kept all of these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own, and give the money to the poor, and then come, follow me. Now when he heard this, he was shocked, and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the 
disciples were perplexed at these words, that Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter into the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter into the kingdom of God. And they were greatly astonished and said to one another, Then who can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. Peter looked at him to say to him, Lord, we have left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age houses, brothers, and sisters, mothers, and children and fields with persecution and in the age to come eternal life but many who are first will be last and the last will be first this is the word of God for us the people of God thanks be to God you may be seated many of you who work for a company or work for the government or civil service you know about a thing that we get sometimes called a cost of living raise. It's not really based on the merits, the work you've done. It's really just based on how inflation drives costs up and tries to keep up with that with your level of salary. So how do companies and the government come up with the cost of living? How do they know how much to give you to give you a raise if you get one? Well. One of the places that they go for that is part of the government. It's called the Consumer Price Index. And so the Consumer Price Index goes through your life and it looks at how much it costs for mortgage and uh, how much typical housing would cost, uh, interest rates. So if you were thinking about moving to another community and you wanted to know, well, how much does it cost to live there compared to here? You could go on that website, you could put up in this uh, zip code and that zip code, and it would tell you a range of things, housing, uh, utilities, gas and uh, electric. Uh, it would tell you things like uh, sewer and water and all of that, just to keep you in a house. But then it goes beyond that. And it, it brings in a wide range of things like food costs in a particular area, particular kinds of food. But also we talk about clothing, talk about repairs, Talk about appliances that you might have to buy. All of these things go into the consumer price index. It's all about what does it cost to be in that community. Well, this young man knew probably a lot about value and that he had had a great amount of success in his life. But there was something in his life that was missing. It's what St. Augustine called that God shaped that God-shaped void in his life. Apparently, he was looking for more. All of his possessions, all of his power, all of his security, all of the people that probably surrounded him to meet his every need as a wealthy, powerful person, none of that could fill that void. And maybe that's your life. You don't have the wealth that he had, but you do have that void. You don't have the peace the security that you wish you had in knowing a God who loves you and you're looking for that today. So the first thing he asked in seeking for that in his life is, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do? Well, isn't that typical? We think because we do things to earn wealth, because we have an idea, or we go to work, or we get an education, or we work hard at our jobs. Therefore, if that brings us financial security and some wealth in our lives, we figure, well, our relationship with God must be about the same. We have to work hard at being a Christian. We have to work hard at pleasing God. What must I do? And keep in mind, this 
young man was young. He, he was he had accomplished a lot apparently in his life very early. If you look at that list of billionaires, top billionaires, most of them got their wealth at a very young age. The first one on that list developed a way to use a home computer to move money, to pay bills, to not have to go to write checks and send checks, but to be able to, to go and, and, and go to a website and, and pay for items. The second one found a way to use, again, home computers to be able to shop for a wide range of things that we might need or not need and order those online and have them delivered to your house, to your doorstep within two days. He was very young when he came up with that idea, that innovative idea. The third one was in commodities and fashion, but again, very young, began to buy up companies. The fourth one developed an operating system for a computer that was more reliable and more flexible than the operating systems for other home computers. And then the one we talked about earlier took the idea that was already around for social media, but he sort of worked it again and perfected it, sold it to college students at first, and then it got throughout the world, and it is now making him billions of dollars. They were all young. They were all inspired by this man. This young man is young. He's looking for what he can do to inherit eternal life, to make his life ready for God, to make things right with God. And so Jesus, the Bible tells us, looks at this young man and the detail in Mark that you don't find in Matthew or in Luke is that Jesus loved him. He saw something in him. He loved him. That's an important detail. Of course, Jesus loved all the people that came to him. But Jesus wanted to cut through all of the wealth and all of those other issues in his life. He was not impressed by all these things that, that were weighing this young man down and holding him back. He loved him. He wanted the best for this young man. He perhaps saw the potential in this young man who had achieved so much in his life so early. And that's how God looks at us. God sees the potential in our lives. He looks at you and me and he sees what we can be, not necessarily what we are right now, but who we can be in his kingdom. Monday Night Matters, the UMN group, we've been studying a, a lesson by a guy named Bob Goff, and he, he makes that clear last, last time, last session, he talked about the potential that God saw in his neighbors and his friends and how part of what he is doing as a Christian is trying to partner with God and seeing that potential as well in the lives of the people he knows in his own life, the potential for greatness in the kingdom of God. Think about that in the Gospels. We see examples of it. Jesus meets this woman, and according to the Bible, she has seven demons. Now, seven is a perfect number, so I think it's not so much about the number. I think it's about her life was so messed up. She was a wreck. And yet, Jesus saw potential in her life as a follower, as a faithful follower and supporter of his ministry. And indeed, she followed Jesus. She followed Jesus all the way to the cross, even after many of the disciples had abandoned Jesus. She was there. She followed Jesus to the grave to prepare his body. She was the first to see the risen Savior who greeted her in the garden. Jesus saw the potential of this troubled person and used her mightily in his kingdom. Jesus saw a short little guy that had cheated a bunch of people in Jericho and climbed in a tree to see Jesus come into town and Jesus saw potential in that cheat, that liar. And he said, come down Zacchaeus, I must be in your house today. He blessed Zacchaeus table. He blessed his house with his presence. Zacchaeus turned his life around and said, I'm going to repay everybody. I'm going to make things right. And 
to Zacchaeus, the town was blessed because of Jesus seeing the potential in Zacchaeus. Jesus, in the beginning of his ministry, goes to the Sea of Galilee. He sees those four fishermen down there struggling to make a living, these crusty young fishermen just trying to make it through the day. And Jesus says, come and follow me. He saw in those young men the potential to found his church, the bride of Christ, in their lives and ministry. They would go on to spread the gospel throughout the known world. They would go on to turn the world upside down for Christ. They would see great things, miracles, churches grow, peoples transform, all from that shore in Galilee. God would use them in a great way. And he sees that potential. Perhaps he saw that potential in that young man. That he, if he could just, just lay aside this wealth that was holding him back, those things of earth that were holding him back, then he could be used in a great way. The question for us is what is holding us back? You notice Jesus quotes some of the scriptures. He quotes scripture from the, the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy. And those scriptures, those particular commandments, all deal with our relationship with each other, about our relationship with our neighbor, about our relationship with our parents, about our relationship with strangers that we might steal from or be tempted to kill or whatever. Those are all human relationships. And the young guy says, I followed all that since I was young. I've done all this. But remember, Jesus did not quote those commandments that deal with our relationship with God. I am the Lord thy God, and you shall have no other gods before me. This guy apparently had another God before God. And so Jesus knows that he's going to have to lay aside that wealth. He's going to have to give it up. Bishop Will Willimon taught it. Duke University and Divinity School for years. He said, and one of his students had an interesting observation about this. She said, you know, I've noticed that the students with potential, those with real talent, those with real uh, intelligence, those are the ones that the professors in my class ride the most. They're hardest on those students. I wonder if it's because those professors know that those students have the potential to really make a difference in the world in that field of study. They have the potential to really move that field of study ahead, no matter what it is, physics or science or math or history, they have that potential, so they are the hardest on them. I wonder if that's perhaps why Jesus was motivated to demand so much from this young man because he saw his potential. He was a mover and a shaker. He was an influencer, perhaps. He could contribute greatly to the kingdom of God. So, what does this mean? Does it mean that all rich people are doomed? Does it mean that all poor people are blessed and more likely to come to Christ? Jesus uses that humorous, I know we don't get the humor of it, but the eye of the needle thing, going through the camel, you know, through the eye of the needle, that is first century humor. Now, if you go to Jerusalem, right near in the Temple Mount area, there's a huge wooden gate, huge door area, and the guides will tell you, look, see that big gate there, there's a small little door so that every time someone had to pass through that big gate, they didn't have to open the whole thing and, and, and be vulnerable. So they would have to kind of squeeze through that little door. And that little door in the Middle East is called the eye of the needle. You have to kind of squeeze through it. And that's what Jesus was talking about because camels were the largest animals of that area. So he's talking about the fact that in order for a camel to go through that little bitty door, that camel would have to unburden itself. You'd have to take all of the package, uh, packing and everything that he was carrying off. And
And that's what relates to this young man. That could be. But it's more likely, since the Greek word here is literally a tailor's needle or a surgeon's needle, that he's really talking about a real needle and a real camel. He's saying that we've got nothing to offer to God. When the young man asks what he can do to inherit eternal life, he can't do anything. And those disciples can't do anything either. They can't earn their way into heaven. And as he said, but even though it's impossible for us to do that, nothing is impossible with God. And so, it wasn't just that this fellow was rich. Other wealthy people followed Jesus. Joseph of Arimathea was wealthy. He provided the tomb for Jesus. Zacchaeus was wealthy. Matthew the tax collector was probably wealthy. Lazarus, Martha, and Mary were probably wealthy. And so it's not the wealth. It is what holds us back from giving our lives to God to do God's will in our lives. And that does not have to be a bank account, folks. We can be held back by all kinds of things in our lives. Our friends and our relationships. We're surrounding ourselves with people who have nothing to do with God, nothing to do with church. And we're afraid to really talk about that to them. They are probably holding us back from being the witness that we're supposed to be. Our careers, our obsession with making more and having more, our consumerism, they can all hold us back from being the people that God wants us to be. Our hobbies, our the sports, hunting, fishing, football, television, all of that can obsess our time, can hold us back from being who God wants us to be in our lives. Not that any of those things are bad in and of themselves. The wealth that this man has was not bad in and of itself, but it was holding him back from being the person that God wanted him to be, from having the potential in his life to give his life in service to God. We are all called to do that. We're all called to be witnesses. We're all called to serve and to follow Christ. Chuck Colson had a conversion experience in his life and wrote books about his faith and his journey. In one of those books, he gives us a pretty graphic example of giving everything to Christ. It really comes from the 19th century when many missionaries were leaving developed countries like England and America and going into remote parts of the world in order to bring the gospel to those people. Now the interesting thing about that is when they would be called to go to a remote area like that, the way that they would pack would be in a large rectangular wooden box that would pack all their uh, possessions into that carry with them or in different places. They would put them on the boat and take off. Now the reason it was a long rectangular box is that they had committed their lives to God to such an extent that the only way they were coming back to their homeland is when that box was their coffin. They would, their bodies would be returned to their homeland. They were selling out. They were all in. Unlike this young man, they were fully committed to live for Christ in a different, distant land and to die for Christ in a distant land. And so many of them did return in those wooden boxes from disease, from violence, from exposure, and some of them just from old days living out their lives Christian witness only to return to their families and be buried at home. Boy, that to me that just touches. The 
fact that Jesus needs us to have that sort of commitment, even though we're not called perhaps to be missionaries in a foreign land, even though we're not called perhaps into full-time Christian ministry uh, in a church, we're each of us called, just as this young man needed to rid himself. We're all called to leave those things that encumber us behind that we can be a witness for Christ. We can be a witness for Christ. The cost of discipleship, Dietrich Bonhoeffer says, whenever Jesus calls a person, he calls them to come and die. It is a full commitment to Christ. The question is, have you trusted Christ like that in your life? Last week we talked about the 10th chapter of Mark a little bit more and the fact that the theme of trust and trusting in God is all through that chapter. Jesus began that discussion with answering questions about marriage and divorce and he makes it clear that marriage is about a trust between spouses holding their relationship in honor of each other and to honor God. Then he talks about the children that came to him that the disciples tried to prevent, but yet Jesus took them in his arms and said, you've got to have this kind of faith, childlike trust in God in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. And then here this young man needs to get rid of everything in his life that prevents him from trusting God fully with his Finding the peace and love of God, the contentment that comes from fully having a relationship with God and having eternal life in the life to come. What about you? Are there things holding you back from fully committing to God? Have you trusted Jesus Christ with your life? Do you continue to live in that trust? Or are you encumbered by things in this world that keep you from doing what that's a question that only you can answer. It's strictly between you and God. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this example. It's a hard one for us to hear. We feel bad for the young man. But we know, Father, that these kind of choices are before us as well. We make the choices in our lives to trust you with our lives, but we have to revisit those that, that decision many times as things come into our lives that encumber us and that weigh us down and keep us from following you as we should. So Father, in the quietness of this moment, speak to our hearts. Show us those things that we need to address in our lives and help us to lay them aside and follow you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing a hymn of commitment. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to as we're singing, I'll ask you to stand if you're able. If you have a decision to make today, perhaps trust Christ with your life, or just renew your relationship with God, just come down and pray. If you'd like for me to pray with you, I will. If you'd like to, me to pray with you about accepting Christ, maybe for the first time, in a trusting relationship, I'll be standing here as we sing.
play here, um, beautiful uh, thank you note, and um, it's a pleasure to serve here and a privilege it's mine. It's, it's helping us grow. Thank you for helping us grow. Very sweet. Well, let's be dismissed. Father, thank you for being with us here today. We can felt your presence. Lord, let us continue to feel that presence as we go into the life in which you have called us, the pathways in which you have set us. Father, help us know that we are your voice, your feet, your hands, wherever we go. So, Father, help us to uh, take all those things that encumber us, that get in our way of following you, lay them aside, and come and be your disciples. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.